We gather here this morning because where else would we go? Something horrible has happened and that demands that it be undone and yet it cannot be undone. We demand answers to questions for which there are no answers. Yesterday, the famous poet and sometimes prophet Maya Angelou said, our country is grieving. Each child who has been slaughtered belongs to each of us and each slain adult is a member of our own family. It is impossible to explain the horror to ourselves and to our survivors. We need simply to hold each other's hands to look into each other's eyes and say, I'm sorry. I think she's right. I think the place you start at a time like this is with sympathy for parents and grandparents of children, 20 elementary school age children, senselessly and violently murdered for no reason and with no warning. Sympathy for the spouses family members and co-workers of six, actually seven, adults because even the shooter leaves behind family and friends, neighbors, and a brother to carry the burden of both grief and guilt. We say, I'm sorry. And from that point, we try to move towards empathy, towards sharing their pain, trying to help lift the burden. We say, I'm sorry to begin to find our compassionate legs, to know how we can personally respond in a way that can bring some healing to the survivors and a determination to try and make sure that this doesn't happen again. I'm not sure what all Maya Angelou meant, but I believe that saying I'm sorry needs to have a larger meaning this time. There's a part of it in which we need to say, I'm sorry, not just out of sympathy or empathy, but to take personal responsibility that it happened at all. To own the fact that we are a part of a society that has now, in 2012, set a record for these kinds of mass murders. And to say, I'm sorry, because those 27 deaths were only unique in the sense that they all happened within a few minutes in one place. There are more than 30 gun deaths every day in the United States. And the fact that they are typically spread out across 50 states doesn't really change the, the horror of the events. Something is wrong with America. Somehow we have a violence sickness a gun addiction. But even in countries where the ratio of guns to citizens is higher than it is in the United States, they have nothing like the amount of gun violence that we have. Something is wrong with us. We murder one another at a rate unprecedented in any other nation or any other country. If you look at it per capita, there are a few nations of the world, and only a few, where you are more likely, based on a per capita ratio, to be murdered than in the United States. But at the top of that list is Mexico and Brazil, Nicaragua, Colombia, Panama, and El Salvador. And if we're at all honest about it, most of those nations have a homicide rate directly related to the American gun industry and to financing from American drug consumption. So even there, we have reason to say to those nations, I'm sorry. I suspect that Maya Angelou was inviting us to mourn rather than to blame, to feel grief rather than anger. I hear that, I do, sincerely, but with all due respect to Miss Angelou, I can do more than one thing at a time. I'm grieving, and I'm really angry. The gun lobbyists hypocritically always insist that we not discuss gun laws in the aftermath of an incident such as this one. They insist that we must respect the victims and not politicize the tragedy. And in saying that, they are themselves politicizing it. It's just a bunch of bull. They know that the public's stomach for thinking about these things makes us turn our attention quickly away. 
The shooting in the movie theater in Colorado this summer where 12 people were killed and 58 were wounded did not receive as much press coverage as when Rush Limbaugh called Sandra Fluke a slut or when, in a shock to the nation, Anderson Cooper announced that he was gay. Tragedy happens, but the gun industry has learned that if they can just cap off the debate for a couple of weeks, that nothing will be done in response. All of us, then, who let these events pass on to the back burner can say, I'm sorry to the survivors in Connecticut. We need to put this issue on the front burner and make it all we talk about until meaningful reform is in place, even if we have to gag every journalist who says the words fiscal cliff. Early in 2007, Molly Ivins made a pledge that she would devote every one of her columns to ending the war in Iraq until the war was ended. She did not know that her own death would come just two columns later. But I wonder if her newspaper subscribers would continue to print column after column on the same topic, even if it took five years. My editor is in the room with us, and I have to wonder whether if I devote every column to gun violence, if I can get them printed every other week. Uh, well, looks like you all need to lean on Linda a little bit before she leaves. <laughs> because we cannot let go of this issue this time. We have to keep it on the front burner. And in fact, even the majority of NRA members agree that there need to be changes to access to guns. The big part of the problem is that most of the huge financial resources of the NRA does not come from its members. If you don't know about this, I'm going to ask you to pay particular attention to what I'm saying right now. The majority of the money that the NRA uses to bribe politicians, and it's that, bribe politicians to prevent sane gun legislation does not come from its citizen members, but it comes from the deep pockets of gun manufacturers. It's the people who profit from the sale of these weapons who keep them from being legislated out of existence. The money that is made on the sale of semi-automatic and assault-style military rifles is what is driving this insanity. There are only so many guns that will be sold for hunting or home protection. And many of those kinds of guns will remain in use in family possession for generation after generation, more than 100 years. The technology behind them doesn't change very much, and so they stay useful. The only way that gun manufacturers can increase their profits is to manufacture a demand for a product that is not only not necessary, but it, it plays on the mentality of people who have paranoid personality disorders and delusions of grandeur. These weapons are slipping across our border to armed drug cartels in Central and South America. They end up in the hands of terrorists, white supremacists, anarchists, and people with very serious mental illnesses. I used to take my daughter when she was little to the Bass Pro Shop so that she could see the, the fish in the tanks and the turtles and the ducks and stand under that big stuffed bear. But hunting and fishing is not moving sports uh, equipment sales along fast enough. So Bass Pro Shops are remodeling to offer weapons for people who have paranoid personality disorders and Jason Bourne fantasies. They now have a tactical weapon shopping area replete with dummies with handguns. And the double entendre in that sentence was intended. <laughs> Soon they will be opening an entire NRA museum intended to spark the yearning for more and bigger weapons. It's in a retail store to make vulnerable, mentally weak people buy more guns. They are being manipulated for profit at the danger of our school children. They will try to tell you that it's a Second Amendment right, 
even though shooting up elementary schools has very little to do with a well-organized militia, and that assault rifles with 100-round clips is not at all something that could have even entered the consciousness of the framers of the Constitution. All I want to hear from the gun lobby is what Maya Angelou said that we should say. All I want to hear them say is, I'm sorry. Anything else they say is a lie. All I want to hear them say is, I'm sorry. And the gun fanatics will trot out their absurd false equivalencies, saying that more people die from auto accidents than from gunshots, as if you could ride your handgun to school or work, or transport the people they wound to the hospital on the rifle that shot them, or dig a grave for their victims with their banana ammo clips. I don't want to hear any more of their dodges or their stupid defenses. What I want to hear them say, will you tell them? What do you want to hear him say? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And the lobbyists will cry out that if only we could repeal the existing gun restrictions, if only everyone in the Colorado theater had been armed, and I suppose the kindergartners and first graders in Connecticut had been armed, they could have stopped this shooter sooner, without any logical appreciation for the fact that it is the proliferation of guns that has driven up the number of fatalities in our nation, not the absence of guns. All I want to hear from the gun lobbyists is, I'm sorry. And to Republicans who have held on to office by catering to the absurd whims of the gun manufacturers, and to Democrats who have decided to have campaign photos holding a hunting rifle in your hands to curry the dumbed down vote, I don't want to hear any more false pretense out of you when you know that what you are doing is just clutching onto power with any kind of deal you can make with the devil in spite of 30,000 gun deaths every year in the nation that you have sworn to serve. All I want to hear out of you is I'm sorry. On this third Sunday of Advent when we traditionally give John the Baptist a moment to speak in church, we desperately need the practical theology of the guy who says, if you've got extra food, you give some to someone who's hungry. If you've got two coats, you need to give someone a coat uh, that doesn't have one. We need that practical wisdom of telling the truth in a prophetic way to say in the choice between your hobby and 30 deaths a day of my brothers and sisters, my children and my grandchildren, don't you dare tell me how much you enjoy your hobby. All I want to hear out of you is I'm sorry. I have no instant solutions to offer. Guns once manufactured and sold remain in use for generations, and there's no effective way of calling them all back. We can, however, make a meaningful start both by addressing the immoral culture that turns so easily to violence and so quickly denies mental health treatment to troubled young men while offering them weapons next to the toy department at Walmart. We can eliminate the sale of guns without background checks. We can put a stop to these crazy gun shows that transfer guns into the hands of terrorists and the deranged. We can take semi-automatic and handguns off the market and we can outlaw high round uh, count uh, ammo clips, and we can make bullets very, very, very expensive. $10,000 each doesn't seem too high to me. Even in small ways, as the song Lovers in a Dangerous Time says, we must kick at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. This sermon then is a call to action in honor of the 20 children who were murdered on Friday, and in honor of the few people that I feel compelled to name by name. The school's principal, Don Hawksprung, the school's psychologist, Mary Sherlock, who, though they were unarmed, when they heard gunshots going off and other adults were scrambling to hide and jump under the tables, these two unarmed women ran into the hallway and confronted the shooter, trying to stop him, and lost their lives in the process. And 27-year-old Vic Victoria Soto, a first grade teacher who used her own body to shield a child, saving the child's life while losing her own, 
So tell me again, Governor Scott Walker, what a bunch of freeloaders these public teachers are in your twisted little mind. These women make me want to be a better man. To all of my friends who tell themselves that your guns will never be used in a mass murder and that you need your guns to protect your family, I encourage you to man up and be as brave as Dawn and Mary and Victoria were. Destroy your weapons and live with more courage so that you can help to create a more sane world. My literature friends often cringe at rhyming poetry, but I must close today with Edna St. Vincent Millay's Dirge Without Music. I am not resigned to the shutting away of loving hearts in the hard ground. So it is and so it will be, for so it has been time out of mind. Into the darkness they go, the wise and the lovely. Crowned with lilies and with laurel they go, but I am not resigned. Down, down, down into the darkness of the grave, gently they go, the beautiful, the tender, the kind. Quietly they go, the intelligent, the witty, the brave. I know, but I do not approve, and I am not resigned. You've been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.